burst forward fast and takes the fin back again. There it goes. Oh, what a heat. Newman spots it in his mind. The game is over. Dale Jarrett throws goalward, but Bob Williams, a standout for the Irish, makes a clutch interception. Notre Dame snaps Oklahoma's 47-game winning streak in the upset of the year. I remember coming in there as a freshman, stepping on the campus, and I turned around to my parents and said, I never want to leave here. It's special, it's different, it's unique, and I would always love it to stay that way. I don't want us to be like any other university. I don't want to be like anybody else. When I came onto the campus, there was an electrical charge that went up my back because all of a sudden I, I sensed this huge responsibility. It's a place that wants to make a difference in the world. And it does that through education, through dialogue, through its academic advancement, its aspirations academically, scholarly. Uh, but it's also combined with moral, ethical, spiritual aspects. It's a way of life. I, I think that's probably the best way for me to explain it, Notre Dame and its ideals and what it stands for as a way of life. And the striving to achieve that ideal is what it's really all about. It gave me a, a sense of pride in my life, and I still go by that today and still do everything the same way of preparation and getting things done and making sure that you treat people right. And I think it gave me a good awareness on where I'm going in my life and where I would like to be when it's all over. It's, it's the heart, the mind, and the soul. I'm a good Catholic kid, one of 12 kids out of Detroit. And for me to come here and, and spend time here, uh, it's, it's, it's a dream. The thing about Notre Dame is not the grotto. It's not touchdown Jesus. It's not even the stadium. It's the people. That's what makes Notre Dame the place that it is. People genuinely love this university, love the, what it stands for and the people here care about one another. If you've been part of the Notre Dame family, you don't have to describe it. If you've never been part of the Notre Dame family, you can never really truly understand. But you don't go to Notre Dame to learn to do something. You go to Notre Dame to learn to be somebody. There is no denying the mystique of Notre Dame. It means different things to different people but it means something to just about everyone. It is legends and icons, monuments and tradition. It's an unquantifiable spirit that permeates the soul of the sacred institution. This spirit moved a 28-year-old French priest to make a bold leap of faith in 1842. With $300 in his pocket, Father Edward Soren founded the University of Notre Dame du Lac, Our Lady of the Lake. It was situated on an expansive tract of Indiana farmland that contained just three log buildings. In a kind of grandiose moment, he called it the University of Notre Dame as opposed to a college. And certainly in its early history, it was mainly a kind of boys' school and a prep school. But out of a uh, school population with so many grade school and high school kids, uh, the priests realized that these kids have to have something to occupy their time. 
And so a whole athletic culture grew up. While athletics was an important part of the curriculum from the onset, football was not played on the campus until 1887. The university got serious about the sport in 1913, when its president, Father John Cavanaugh, hired Jess Harper, a young protege of Amos Alonzo Stagg. Dad went up there on the Wabash Railroad and met with him. And they hired him as coach of football, basketball, baseball, and track, and director of athletics for $2,500 a year. Harper earned every penny of that $2,500, winning 34 of the 40 games he coached in five years. In 1918, Harper gave way to his former player and assistant coach, Knut Rockne. Rockne needed good players to carry on his mentor's legacy. He found one in a young baseball player named George Gipp. He was a superb athlete, by all accounts, a natural athlete, just one of these uh, guys who could do anything. And Rockney recognized this immediately, recognized he had to have this guy play for him. Gipp responded by rushing for over 2,300 yards and passing for nearly 1,700 yards. He scored 21 touchdowns, kicked 27 PATs, punted for 3,700 yards, and did not allow a pass completion in his territory. The Irish won all but five games they played during his four years in uniform. Despite his gridiron success, baseball remained Gipp's first love. He even had planned to join the Chicago Cubs after graduation. But Gipp contracted a strep throat infection just before Thanksgiving in 1920. He never recovered. Supposedly, while he was on his deathbed, you know, he told Rockney, when the boys are up against it, Rock, you know, tell them to win one for the Gipper. Well, nobody knows if that story's true. But in 1928, Notre Dame was playing a superior army team. And Rockney pulled that speech uh, out of his pocket before the game began. And Notre Dame went out, uh, spirit soaring and upset army. And the Notre Dame mystique uh, just grew again by leaps and bounds. Another Notre Dame legend was created in 1924 by sports writer Grantland Rice after the Irish beat Army 13 to 7 on October 18th. Rice crafted one of the most famous passages to ever appear in newsprint. Outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. In dramatic lore, they are known as famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. These are only aliases. Their real names are Stuldreyer, Miller, Crowley, and Layden. Rice got the idea from a Notre Dame student named George Strickler, who told him about a Rudolph Valentino movie he had seen, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Rice, like uh, most reporters, uh, shamelessly would steal anything at hand because he's got a deadline, he's got to get it out. And so he sits there and uh, when after Notre Dame wins the game, he types out, outlined against a blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. That so caught the public imagination. When the team returned to South Bend, Strickler took the gimmick a step farther. He set up a photograph of the four Notre Dame stars actually sitting on horses. That picture, in my opinion, of the four horsemen is one of the most famous pictures of the 20th century. You show that picture, people know what it is. The four horsemen and their seven mules in the offensive line were just one more chapter in an ongoing saga of success. Rockne had created a dynasty that had captured the fancy of ethnic America. We had so many people coming through these you know, vast ways of migration, uh, and so many of them were ethnic Catholics that uh, you know, when they saw the sign, you know, no Irish Catholics need apply, you know, in their local hometowns back in the 20s and the, the teens and even into the 30s, um, it was nice to see some little school on the prairie beating the big boys. Uh, you know, there was kind of a, a sense, I think, that it could generate hope. They became the, the pride of the Irish, and they got that name put on them, and it's here today. The, uh, and it's a proud name because it, it vindicated uh, people who were much troubled where they lived in Ireland and more trouble when they came here. 
So I have to say that uh, that was how we burst into some prominence, because there's a lot of Irish in America. That emerging prominence enabled the university to earn a good deal of money, despite the devastating financial plight of the country. When Newt Rockney was playing around the country to capacity crowds, and this was a depression now coming along that hit in 29 with the stock market crash, and in the 30s while I was here was the depth of the depression. But Notre Dame had earned quite a bit of money in football during that 10-year period prior to this because of Rockney, and they used that to build the campus at that time. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Notre Dame became a truly great university to a considerable degree because of its football team and the renown that the football team gained for, for the university and the revenues that it brought in that could then be put into building academic buildings and funding scholarships and so on. That said, students, professors, coaches, and administrators concur that academics have always been first and foremost at the University of Notre Dame. People still want to see uh, these, these programs run right. Uh, where kids are really in class, and I mean really in class, really knowing something uh, so that when they come out they can run corporations, they can uh, stand in front of a jury and, and make a co compelling argument, they can uh, do open heart surgery with somebody. Uh, I, I've taught at other universities, and believe me, that's not the case with our athletes, far from it. Um, here it is. The experience of being a student athlete living in the dorms, being a participant, in the athletic programs on the football team has made me what I am today. The foundation of who I am was set. Whether I knew it or I didn't know it, I do now. But when I was there, I didn't know that it was molding me to be who I am today. I didn't realize it was giving me the confidence to feel like I can do anything. I realized early that they put me in dormitories with people from different parts of the country. The, the Holy Cross are missionaries, so they want us to meet everybody. So it, there is an intention of Notre Dame of getting you to, to build personal relationships. If you look at the composition of the student body, all races, all religions, uh, and yet uh, they're together. We're very much an international institution. Religion is obviously an important facet of Notre Dame's allure and heritage. A leisurely stroll through the campus underscores its significance. The signature landmark is the Golden Dome of Our Lady, next door to the magnificent Basilica of the Sacred Heart. Tucked away discreetly behind the Basilica is the Grotto, a refuge for peaceful reflection and prayer. The campus also features monuments that have become football metaphors. A statue of Notre Dame's third president, Father William Corby, is called Fair Catch Corby, for obvious reasons. While Touchdown Jesus stands sentry over the house that Rock built. No one ever thought of it when we put the mural on this library here. Figure of Christ with his arms raised, there's nothing unusual about that, you know, blessing the people. No one ever thought, at least I didn't, and I was involved in the building of it and certainly no one else did, that the cameras from the stadium could pan on it and make it look like Touchdown Jesus. There are a lot of uh, tourists who, uh, who want to see the icons. Uh, I think a lot of them simply want to identify with the place. Uh, they're hoping their, their kids can go here. Uh, if they can't, they're, they just want to touch and feel the reality of the place. The reality is simple. Notre Dame's following throughout the world is a phenomenon unlike any other. When I was fortunate enough to uh, have an opportunity to play in the Hula Bowl, and I went to an all-star game at the college level, I was invited to Hawaii. I flew over to Hawaii. I remember getting off the plane, and there were great college All-Americans on that plane. But I got off that plane, and over and off to the side, there were 50 people clapping and cheering and everything, and it was the Notre Dame Club of Hawaii that had come out to meet me, that's what separates, I think, the University of Notre Dame from every place else. You smell the smells. I mean, the, the barbecue, the meat cook, and the, you know, the tailgates, and you hear the people and the bands. You know, there's always, the, somebody's always got their, you know, beating on a drum somewhere, you know? And just one of those things where it, 
it was the perfect day. Saturday afternoons were the, was the perfect day. Walking from the church Saturday morning to the stadium, it's the best experience of college football. I mean, I can't imagine anything better than that. Uh, it's a special time in life, that's for sure. It's all these things and more that give Notre Dame its mystique. The vibrant, picturesque campus and its historic landmarks, a serious commitment to academic achievement, religion, ethnicity, and family. Colorful icons and phenomenal success against great odds. Yes, Notre Dame has built a legacy that is unparalleled in the history of sport. This is more than a football program. This is an American institution. It's a piece of Americana. It's a very exciting story, the history of Notre Dame football. Five-year-old Knut Rockne and his Norwegian family immigrated to Chicago in 1893. The young Knut proved to be an adept athlete and an excellent student, but college would have to wait. Instead, Rockney went to work at the Chicago Post Office for four years. He saved enough money to pay for college and chose Notre Dame. He was a diminutive guy. I mean, he weighed like 147 pounds play, playing right in. You had little men, but they were all fast. Rockney was a half mile and a pole vault in track. And he was known more originally for his track than he was for football. Rockney played and later coached for Harper's father, Jess. When Coach Harper stepped aside in 1917, he handed the reins to his star pupil. Rockney, as an assistant coach, was very popular with the students and such, and other schools knew about him. And he applied for various jobs. In fact, if Harper had not gone back to Kansas when he did, Rockney would have probably become the coach of uh, what is now Michigan State. There were famous coaches before Rockney, but Rockney was the first celebrity coach. Um, and Rockney really worked at it. I mean, he really worked the press. Uh, you know, he did favors for sports writers. You know, he cultivated the press in all kinds of ways. And he, and he was a, a, apparently a, a, a truly charismatic man. I mean, people were just drawn to him. I don't want anybody here to come out for spring football who don't want to. As a matter of fact, I don't want spring football unless you do. Now, uh, all those in favor of coming out for spring football, those who insist on having football, insist on having Hunk and Shav and Vadish and I uh, take charge of this spring, will all signify by saying aye. He was a stutter, and he couldn't give a speech first year he was a coach. But he worked on it, and he developed this rapid delivery of speech to overcome the stuttering concept. But don't forget, man, we're going to get him on the run. We're going to go, 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 go. And we aren't going to stop until we go to that goal line. Don't forget, man, today is the day we're going to win. He worked for the Studebaker Company. And he was making 10000 a year as coach and athletic director at Notre Dame, and they paid him more for one year of going around, I think, to 24 regional uh, sales meetings. And he would talk nothing but football, never mention a car sale. And immediately after he left, those sales just climbed dramatically. The thing that could help them most, the thing that could inspire them and refresh them, would be to go out to see a high school or a college team play basketball and play football, because there, they do not justify defeat. Those lads do not feel sorry for themselves, but they stick in there and give the best out of themselves until the last was a blow. I would say that Rockne was probably the best salesman in this country has seen. He sold himself and the university to the very best football players he could find. As a result, Rockne won 105 games and three national championships in 13 seasons. He rode the mythic four horsemen to his first title in 1924. The watershed game was a 13-7 victory over powerful army at the polo grounds. 1928 was a trying year for Rockney. His team had lost two games and the injury-riddled Irish were outmanned as they prepared to face unbeaten army at Yankee Stadium. Notre Dame would need every advantage it could find. 
So Rockne summoned up the name of his greatest star, George Gipp, who had died eight years earlier. Rockne mentions Gipp, and he doesn't do the famous speech because that had not been written yet. Uh, that was written two years later by his ghostwriter. But he talks about Gipp, and he talks about uh, how well he had done against the army, and how about winning this game. The speech apparently worked. Notre Dame won, 12 to 6. The following year, Rockne and his team became nomads as construction commenced on a new football stadium at Notre Dame. He scheduled road games in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And this created the Subway alumni. These are the millions of Notre Dame fans around the country who never attended the school, but have very passionate feelings about the football team. And during the 1920s, a lot of those Subway alumni were poor, they were Irish, they were Catholic, and while they struggled with prejudice and trying to join the country's middle class, they took tremendous pride in Notre Dame's success on the football field. That success reached a crescendo in 1929 and 1930. Rockne's teams didn't lose a single game and won back-to-back -back national titles. The 1930 season featured a one-point triumph against Army in front of 110,000 fans at Chicago's Soldier Field. The Irish followed up with a 27 to nothing shutout of USC in Los Angeles in the season finale. When the team returned to South Bend, it was greeted by thousands of fans who turned out to pay homage to their conquering heroes. Rockne was just 43 years old and had already become an icon. His popularity and celebrity had rivaled the status typically reserved for presidents and movie stars. In fact, Hollywood was calling and asking Rockne to film a football demonstration movie. On March 31st, 1931, he boarded Transcontinental Western Flight 599 in Kansas City, bound for Los Angeles. Shortly after the takeoff, the plane flew into a vicious spring storm and crashed in a wheat field near Bazaar, Kansas. There were no survivors. I can remember vividly when the guy coming down the street yelling, extra, extra, Newt Rockney killed. Uh, everybody heard that and everybody was sorry because he was a great figure here. Even now, decades and scores later, Newt Rockney remains the greatest coach in the history of college football. He won national titles, and he made people who had no interest in college football care about college football. There are just certain people come along in your lifetime, not very many of them. Doesn't take long to call roll with this class that are people like Newt Rock. They're just great natural leaders and winners. What he brought to the ethos of Notre Dame football in, in that very pivotal time in, in American history, not just in football history or college football history, uh, the whole idea that, that you could come off the floor and survive and then win and do very well meant not just a lot to, to, uh, to Nuke Rockney and Notre Dame, but to all America. And I think the idea that here comes Notre Dame meant a lot to the country. Rockney's tragic death stunned the Notre Dame community. How could they carry on? Assistant Hunk Anderson took the helm for three years, followed by one of the famous four horsemen, Elmer Layton, who coached the Irish for seven seasons. But neither man lived up to the lofty expectations established by Rockney. So in 1941, the university signed on yet another Rockney player, a feisty one-time boxer named Frank Leahy. But unlike Rockney's immediate successor, Leahy had already proven himself as a head coach. He started coaching at Georgetown, moved on to Michigan State, coached Vince Lombardi at Fordham, and went undefeated as head coach at Boston College in 1940. 
Frank Leahy was welcomed by his alma mater with open arms. Football season began, he used to sleep in the firehouse instead of going home, which is kind of unusual. He had eight kids, and they were wonderful, and most of them, I think, came to Notre Dame. He was uh, a guy who wanted not just 100%, but 110 at least. And he did that of himself. It wasn't he was just picking on players and coaches. He was that way himself. Maybe today he wouldn't have been as successful because he, he, he was a fundamentalist. And, and everything he did, he did to perfection. And he expected his team, every individual member of his team, to do it to perfection. Now, now we know we're not all perfect. And, uh, but he stride, and he wanted us to stride to that perfection. And uh, he wouldn't, uh, you know, if you didn't do it, he was very sarcastic. You know, like he used to say to me all the time, oh, John Latner, John Latner, you should be in the Navy. You know, you're a cruiser. You know, cruiser? I, gee, I thought at least I'd be a battleship, but not a cruiser. But uh, those things motivated me. He was a technician in, uh, in a lot of ways, and... Uh but he demanded uh, great discipline and uh, physical, the physical part of the game was important to him. You beat the team down that you're facing across the line, later on they'll get soft in the fourth quarter, you know, which is the way. And they, they, the players were in awfully good shape because they scrimmaged so much. When we got on the 10-yard line, uh, it was rare that we never scored because uh, we had Friday nights, we had what we call, or Thursday night, the 10-yard draw and that could last an hour. And he put the best defense against the best offense, and you just kept going in, and of course, uh, drive, drive, drive. We had such a discipline there that, uh, that, that frankly, he engendered in the team in general, was a great coach. And the discipline really uh, made it so we, we just didn't lose. It was a disappointment. We had two ties. In 11 years at Notre Dame, Leahy's teams recorded 87 victories against a mere 11 defeats and nine ties. He built an immortal dynasty in the 1940s, winning national championships in 1943, 46, 47, and 49. His teams finished second in 1948 and 1953. But the pressure Leahy had placed upon himself all those years had taken its toll. He was exhausted and retired after the 1953 season. Leahy never coached again. His health was failing a little bit, but the funny thing about that, you know, this is really, I, you know, I thought he was a lot older than 47. He was only 47 years old when he reti re retired from Notre Dame. He was a young man, he was a very young man. But 11 years down at Notre Dame, it takes your toll on your body, your mind, the whole bit. You know, all the, all the Leahy boys, they just love Frankly, they might have hated him while they played for him, but they realized uh, what he did for those players with his discipline and his his demands. You know, he was determined to be the best, and he was willing to pay the price to be it. So he was just a great football coach, though. You know, creative, and uh, he uh, was able to adapt to the changes in the game, to the T formation, and other things that were happening very quickly. Made the most of them, and had the record to show for it. Terry Brennan inherited Leahy's players when he took the helm in 1954 and lost but a single game. The next season, it was two losses, and in 1956, only two wins. After five seasons on the job, Brennan was replaced by Joe Kaherick, who lasted only four years thanks to a 17-23 and 23 record. Assistant Hugh DeVore was appointed interim coach in 1963, but won only two games. Meanwhile, just north of Chicago, a young Armenian named Ara Pasigian was getting noticed at Northwestern, in spite of his win-loss record. I coached with Ara at uh, Northwestern, and um, the second year that we were there, we lost every game. And I watched him operate, because I was an assistant on his staff, I watched him operate under those circumstances. But I'm going to tell you something, when you go through a season where you don't win a game, then you really find out the strength and character of the head coach. 
and he was magnificent. That's when I really got interested in him because every game he lost was either by one point or one touchdown. And at the end of the season, even after many injuries, they were playing just as well as at the beginning. And I said, this man must be a genius of a coach to be able to play this schedule against much tougher uh, opposition and do so well. And then we played him four years during Kuhari's four-year tenure, and he beat us every year. And so that made an impression on me. Father Joyce was under considerable pressure from the alumni to retain the popular Notre Dame man, DeVore. But DeVore was nearly 60 years old, and Joyce was concerned about his age. As he pondered his options, Father Joyce got a phone call from Parsegian, who had just resigned at Northwestern. I said, you're interested in coming to Notre Dame? He said, yes, I certainly am. I said, well, let me tell you, I'm, I think we would be interested in you. And then I brought Father Hesburgh in on the conversation with Aaron. The two of us drove up to Chicago and met him with him on a snowy night in a motel. And both of us came to the conclusion that this was our next coach. And they were accepted immediately, and that was it. Parsegian became the first outsider to coach Notre Dame football in half a century. Not only did he not have the ties to Notre Dame, he wasn't Catholic either. Sports editor of the Lafayette uh, Courier Journal, Gordon Graham, uh, he called Charlie Callahan, who was the SID at Notre Dame, and uh, asked him, well, have you learned how to spell it yet? Oh, yes, I do, Charlie says, P-A-R-S-E. No, I don't mean Parsegan, I mean Presbyterian. <laughs> he had these really piercing dark eyes. And he was a father figure to a lot of those players. If you talk to Notre Dameers from the early 60s when Eric first showed up, a lot of them refer to those years as Camelot. Eric came in and immediately turned things around. Uh, and you had a base here. You had a student body that was all male, that had a football tradition bar none. Uh, and they were very, very hungry. So it was electric time to be here. In Parsegian's first season at Notre Dame, his team won nine straight games before losing to USC in the waning moments of the season finale. Ara Parsegian was 90 seconds away from winning a national championship in his very first year. He, he knew football. There's no coach in the country that knows both sides of the ball and football better than he does. He, he's an absolute master at defense and offense. Parsegian best utilized the talent that he had. He rarely put us a round peg in a square hole. He had the right person in the right job. One of his favorite sayings that he, we must find their breaking point, and then we would exploit that. And what he always did, we, we would pick out the best player offensively. We'd pick out the best player on the defense. And we said, if we can beat him, we'll demoralize the rest of the team. And that's what he would do. He did it for 11 seasons at Notre Dame winning over 83% of the games he coached. He won the national championship in 1966 and 1973. And he did it with a distinctive demeanor that mixed intensity and discipline with compassion and morality. He was, other than my mother, the mother and father, he was the single most uh, influencing person in my life. He talks to you like a human being. He knows that you are going to be part of his team and also, he wants to help you out later in life. Uh, you know, almost teaching life skills about how to uh, monitor your life, uh, be responsible, um, take care of yourself, and you know, take care of people around you. So it really made you into a team player. To this day, I'm in awe. I don't know what it is. There are very few people in the world who I stand in the presence of and feel so humble, like, um, there's a reverence about him. And he always made you feel as though you were important and he expected a lot of you. And so he placed a lot of demands on all the players to do well in the classroom as well as on the field. And he pushed us. And uh, I think as a result of that, you saw the success that he had. But I think it also played a little toll on him as well, personally. I think that uh, he pushed himself so hard and, and uh, it kind of shortened his career. I had made my decision that I was going to step aside after 25 years of coaching. Uh, and we weren't going to announce it until after the bowl game, but unfortunately it leaked out and it was published before that, uh, which I was uh, disappointed about, frankly, because I didn't want them to go into the bowl game thinking that uh, I was not going to be there the following year and so forth. 
um, but that's the way it happened. It was a shock for us. Um, we were hoping that he even, you know, might take a year off and come back. You hear all those kind of stories, and uh, uh, but it was quite a shock. You know, when I when I came in here, I thought uh, I would uh, have the opportunity to play for uh, Coast Brush Legion for uh, uh, for four years. But Weiler and his teammates would have just one more game with Arapahoe Legion on January first, nineteen seventy-five. The ninth-ranked Irish would play top-ranked and undefeated Alabama in the Orange Bowl. You realize that there's 25 years. I'm, I can, the best way I can describe it is that I remember my last game as a college player uh, at Miami of Ohio. And I remember coming onto the field. I knew that was going to be my last game. I had tears coming out of my eyes because of the, the emotion that was going with that. But when I came out uh, against uh, my last time as a coach, I didn't have that tears coming out, but I had a sense of, uh, uh, of emotional letdown in a sense. Uh, yet I knew that there was a challenge ahead that we had to face. Parsegian's team responded to that challenge by taking a 13 to nothing lead over the Crimson Tide. Bear Bryant's team rallied, as one might expect, but the Irish drew strength from their resolve. Notre Dame won the game 13 to 11, and just like that, it was over players loved him because he was honest and fair. He always knew where you stood with Aaron. Um, if he didn't like something, he told you, and you knew about it. And he always had, knew what everybody was up to, on and off the field. He knew what was going on in their lives. And he always felt that he cared. I think that's really what mattered. He really cared about his players. One of the very best we ever had, you know, that he could be compared to Rock Nee or any of the great coaches, I think, in a, this century. Aaron was just a great coach. Dan Devine had earned enough acclaim coaching Arizona State in Missouri that he was hired by the Green Bay Packers in 1971. Four years later, he replaced Parsegian at Notre Dame. His record spoke for itself when you look back at Arizona State and Missouri and the program, frankly, it started out at Arizona State and where he finished up. So we knew there was uh, no reason to have any letdown in what we were performing or expected to do at Notre Dame because really you're expected to perform at a high caliber and there's no doubt that they brought in somebody that was gonna be successful. Devine went to work immediately, hoping to build on the foundation Parsegian had established. His first two seasons were promising. Eight wins and three losses in 1975. Nine wins and three losses in 1976. Devine was making steady progress, thanks in part to his deaf personnel decisions. He had a knack, I think, for getting players in the right positions. I think most of the guys on our defense that senior year were guys that probably came to Notre Dame as offensive players. I was recruited as a quarterback. Our free safety, Joe Restick, was a quarterback. Uh, Doug Becker, our linebacker, was a fullback. Uh, so he had his knack for getting kids in the right position for the betterment of the team. The 1977 season dawned with renewed optimism. The Irish were stacked with a bevy of established stars and a promising junior quarterback named Joe Montana. You know, we, we came up together. Uh, you know, we watched him. I watched him in practice. Uh, just knew this guy had something special all the time. And just watching Joe play on the field, being so calm, being so cool, and being a good general. Devine liked what he was seeing in the development of Montana. Together with receivers Chris Haynes and Ken McAfee, a potent passing game was beginning to evolve. Jerome Heavens and Vegas Ferguson formed an explosive running attack. Bob Golick and Ross Browner led an increasingly ferocious defense. The team struggled early and lost the second game of the season. But now it was beginning to gel, and just at the right time. Arch rival USC was the next challenge on their schedule. But victory would require a nearly flawless performance. Anticipating that his players may need a little added incentive, Devine quietly devised a subtle but dramatic plan to inspire the Irish. They had not played up to their potential. I think they had lost one, maybe I, I, the details, I don't know but they were concerned. Now, this was a team that had some great football players on them, and they did wind up with a national championship. And they came out warmed up, and it had the, all the intensity, and we would struggle a little bit early, too. 
And then he went in and then we came out and all of a sudden this Trojan horse comes out of the tunnel and, and here they come out of the Trojan horse in these bright green jerseys, which was surprised everyone. The thing I remember more, I mean, I'm saying, who cares what jerseys these guys wear, you know? Uh, but the crowd, it was the, the noise intensity, I could feel it on my face. There would be no stopping the inspired green machine on this day. They dominated the game and rode the wave of emotion to a 49-19 trouncing of the Trojans. And that was only the beginning. The Irish stormed through their remaining five games, outscoring opponents by a margin of 230 to 51. The season concluded with a stunning 38 to 10 upset of top-ranked Texas in the Cotton Bowl. It was quite possibly one of the greatest Cinderella stories in college football history. A team that was counted out early in the season found the strength and courage to become national champions. It was the defining moment of Devine's Notre Dame career. I'm not going to say there's any possibility that we won't be voted number one because we're the best football team in the United States. Anybody that wins a national title in his third year at Notre Dame, uh, I think certainly deserves to be mentioned with, with the coaching legends. 1980 was Devine's final season in South Bend. The Irish won their first seven games and steadily rose to the top spot in the polls. But just as quickly as they staked their claim, the Irish lost their footing. Notre Dame's next game was against Georgia Tech, and it ended in a 3-3 tie. The team returned to form a week later against fifth-ranked Alabama in Birmingham. The victory earned the Irish an invitation to meet top-ranked Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. The Fighting Irish dominated the statistical battle, but committed too many turnovers to survive against the powerful Bulldogs. Star running back Herschel Walker led Georgia to a seven-point victory and the national title. It was an unfortunate conclusion to an illustrious career. But no one could deny Dan Devine's impact on Notre Dame football. When you look at his results in the, in the games that he won and the national championship that he won, uh, you know, certainly I think his record is going to put him up there with anybody in terms of his standing in, in, the, in the Notre Dame football history book. The pressure of coaching at Notre Dame is unquantifiable. Millions of passionately fervent fans known as the Subway alumni, make the job a blessing if you win, a curse if you don't. I asked Lou Holtz once, was this job bigger than you thought? He said, in my wildest dreams, I could not have imagined a job like this because of the profile of the University of Notre Dame. Lou Holtz replaced Jerry Faust, who won just half the games he coached during his five-year tenure in South Bend. Holtz was a bundle of energy and enthusiasm. He had overachieved at William & Mary, Arkansas, and Minnesota, but his toughest challenge was still to come. He came in at a time when we'd kind of had our ups and downs through the Jerry Faust era, and I think Lou was gonna come in and, and be a little bit of a whirlwind. During practice, he would stay up in this tower and watch practices, and if he came down, I'll bet wrong. And you were just hoping that he would go to the other side of the ball because if he came to where your side of the ball, whether you were offense or defense, it was going to be a rough day. I tell the athletes, when you come home from the office, you're 32 years of age, and the bank turned down the mortgage on your home, and you wrecked your car, and you got fired, and you come home, you got four kids, and they tell you your wife just ran off with a drummer, you won't even flinch. You'll know how to handle it. I've been in tougher situations than this. I played for Coach Holtz. We're going to have it in our life. We're going to have it sometime today. We're going to have it sometime next week. And you're going to have it the rest of your life, but you'll never achieve anything. Do we understand that adversity is what we look for? Because in adversity, there's opportunity. One thing that he stated to me that you're going to get your diploma, your degree. And if you don't get it, I'm going to end up coaching. And I didn't want to see this guy without a job. So, you know, I didn't really have to prove anything to anyone, but to make me feel better, I did what I had to do, uh, thanks to Coach Holtz, by giving me the opportunity, opportunity to attend this university. And um, 
just by not seeing me as an athlete, seeing me as a total person in and out of the classroom. He made you take responsibility for your whole life, for your actions, and it wasn't just how far you could throw a ball or how fast you could run. Those were good things too, but we're 19 years old playing in front of 100,000 people and didn't even realize it. And weren't even set on that. We were thinking about our obligation to each other and our commitment to the university and those things, and I think that brought us closer together. Well, I think college is a critical time in an individual's life. When you get out of high school, everything you believe religiously, politically, socially, et cetera, is a reflection of what your parents believe. Now you go away to college, you're on your own, you have to make these decisions for yourself. And the people you're going to be associated with, both teammates or college students or coaches, are going to influence that greatly. And you look back and you say, those were my formative years. That's what really prepared me for life. Hulse's influence began immediately. But rebuilding the Fighting Irish into a contender would take time. In his first season, the team finished a game under 500. But five of those defeats were decided by a combined total of 14 points. There was more improvement in 1987, setting the stage for what would become a perfect season in 1988. Hulse's team won all 12 games it played by an average margin of nearly 19 points a game. He had everything working, including having the perfect quarterback for his offense, which was Tony Rice. I think Lou Holtz knew that if he could ever get Tony Rice on the field running the show for him and experience Tony Rice on the field running the show for him, that they had a chance to be great. He was a great coach, and he helped turn things around. And actually, Lou should have won two more national championships. You go into the Orange Bowl, you beat the number one team in the country by 12 points, 21 to 9. And they beat Colorado. You mean to tell me that you're not the national champion? Notre Dame came from fifth that one year when they beat Texas in the Cotton Bowl and became the national champion, didn't they? Right. The game against, uh, the game against uh, Boston College because they lost in the last minute. That cost them a national championship. Why? They beat the number one team in the country, Florida State. They should have been national champions that year. Lou should have had three. He got one. The Irish finished second in both 1989 and 1993. Holtz left Notre Dame after the 1996 season. Assistant Bob Davey took over and won more than he lost during his five seasons. Stanford's Tyrone Willingham was next in line. He immediately peaked enthusiasm while leading the Irish to a 10 and one start in 2002. But the team lost its final two games and could only manage subpar results in the two succeeding seasons. After eight years of sometimes dramatic peaks and valleys, athletic director Kevin White searched for the right man to lead the Irish into the future. His quest ended in Boston with a Notre Dame graduate who was running the offense of the three-time Super Bowl champion New England Patriots. His intellect was the thing that really jumped out at me. In addition to that, I, I think the other thing that was most noticeable was his, uh, his desire to be at Notre Dame. Uh, he's uh, obviously, as, as everybody knows, a Notre Dame guy and a uh, very proud Notre Dame man. And, and I could sense that he was really passionate about the opportunity to come back to South Bend and be part of Notre Dame football. Weiss graduated from Notre Dame in 1978. He never played football for the Irish, but he was zealously involved as a student. He uh, loved sports. He participated in just about everything he could think of. The thing that was interesting, no matter what you talked about, what type of sport, Charlie always knew something about it and knew somebody involved with it. Yurik should know. He lived next door to Weiss in Flanner Hall for four years. I think certainly having been a student at Notre Dame, uh, I think that's a tremendous advantage uh, in, a, in a number of ways. First of all, you've got a great appreciation for just what the place is about and what the culture is about and just what it's going to be like for a student athlete. He knew he had all these factions that were going to be anti-Charlie Weiss when he came here. What does he do? He gets the academicians on his side. He gets the students on his side by, by meeting with them. He wins the players over. He makes believers out of them. And Notre Dame had a great season last year. We expected to win. And I think this year we saw ourselves in different games making plays that we'd never made before. 
Uh, we saw, you know, Brady's passes had a whole lot more touch. We saw receivers making the catches, running backs making the cuts. Um, there were no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So when we were getting into the fourth quarter, that last two minute drive, it was just business as usual. And that was a mindset that we were given by Coach Weiss. He wants perfection, he wants to win every single day, you know, every single game. Uh, that's, that's him, if anything less than that, you know, he's not gonna accept it. Zibikowski's words are fitting for any of these prominent men who have coached the Irish. They have left us with a vivid memory of their struggles and triumphs. Each of them has transformed intelligent, talented, and hardworking young men into confident, caring, and successful adults. They are icons whose contribution to the achievement and lore of Notre Dame is immeasurable. Tomorrow we take on the Trojans, a team that has not been defeated in 23 games. Wait a minute. Let's not lose sight of the fact that we're undefeated too. Yeah. And I want to be able to count on the Notre Dame spirit tomorrow afternoon. For there to be a rivalry anywhere in society, there has to be something at stake. And for so many years, it was the University of Southern California and the University of Notre Dame, both putting out high-profile athletes, both competing for a national title, one on the West Coast, one in the mid part of the United States, both with great heritages as a part of college football. Now you put all that together, you get yourself a rivalry. The rivalry began in 1926, when USC lured Knut Rockne's popular team to the West Coast. USC saw this opportunity to get the LA market. So a delegation came from USC to Notre Dame and offered them a huge amount of money, offered actually the priests who ran the school. They brought in Rockney. Now they weren't that keen on the huge uh, train ride to Los Angeles and how much time it would take for the uh, student athletes. But they told Rockney about it and he said, oh, that's fabulous, we've got to take that money because it was a six-figure guarantee which was huge in the 1920s. So on December 4th, 1926, Notre Dame made its West Coast debut. Over 74,000 fans came to see the hometown Trojans play the famous Fighting Irish. And what a game it was. With two minutes left to play, quarterback Art Parisian threw a 23-yard strike to Butch Nemec, lifting Notre Dame to a thrilling 13-12 victory. It didn't take long for the Notre Dame-USC game to become one of the most anticipated athletic events of the year. They would take the train, and it was just like a presidential whistle stop tour. They would stop at these towns and then give a little speech and everybody in the town would come out and here comes the Notre Dame team. And of course, they would go all the way out to California. In 1947, Frank Leahy and his undefeated Irish boarded that train bound for California. It would be the biggest showdown yet in the 19 game series. Number one ranked Notre Dame versus number three ranked USC in front of 105,000 people at the Coliseum. The game never lived up to its billing. The Irish crushed the men of Troy 38 to 7. The following year, Leahy's lads made a return trip to Los Angeles, riding a streak of 27 games without a loss. Billy Gay was our uh, kick returner, and uh, there was they were they had just scored, and it was uh, 14 to 7, and uh, Billy, I think, it was a less than two minutes to play and he didn't know he he asked the official and the official said well there's not enough time well he said well what's the time how much time and i and he said well a minute and 40 seconds or something and he said oh, that's enough time he ran it back 80 yards and of course we, once we got down close enough we we took it out emil sitko scored his second touchdown of the day and steve Aracco kicked the extra point to earn a hard fought 14 14 tie the rivalry became so popular throughout the country that TV executives chose the 1951 game as the very first national telecast. 
Father Hesburgh, who was not the president at the time, uh, came in and talked to all of us uh, before we got on the bus to go to the Coliseum. He said, I want you to know one thing. Today, for the first time, this game is going to be televised. Any game, any athletic game, football, is going to be televised coast to coast. And there'll be 60 million people out there watching this game. And you know what? There'll be a lot of people that have never seen Notre Dame play, that would love to see Notre Dame play, that never heard them on the radio. This will be the first opportunity. So don't you think you want to do something for those people? That's all he said. We went after we won. In 1953, Latner scored four touchdowns to lead the second-ranked Irish to a 48-14 win in Frank Leahy's last season as coach. Eleven years later, first-year Notre Dame coach Ara Persigian brought his top-ranked undefeated team to Los Angeles. His opponent, fifth-year USC coach John McKay. Before I came to the West Coast, I was a Notre Dame fan. I grew up as an Irish Catholic in a small town in West Virginia, and my team was Notre Dame. It's always been a big game, probably the best biggest intersectional game each year played in this country and everybody in the country was kind of interested to see who would win and uh, we had some tremendous games tremendous games with some funny outcomes but there was nothing funny about this outcome for Notre Dame the Irish built a 17 to nothing halftime lead that slowly evaporated in the second half it was a great game a lot of people there and uh, we hit uh, Quick for you hit Rod Sherman on a slant pass, post pattern, and we won the game. It broke their heart. The disappointments of the Southern Cal series are probably the most paramount thing from a negative standpoint uh, for the players and the staff and me personally because of the impact. We took, I think, three, uh, at least three undefeated teams out there, of which I think we lost uh, two of them. But Barsegian also had some big wins against SC. The biggest came in 1966. After the top-ranked Irish tied second-ranked Michigan State, the team took its frustrations out on the Trojans in the final game of the season. It wasn't that we tried to run it up. Uh, that was not our intention. Uh, it was just that's the way the ball game. They fumbled, or we made an interception, ran it back for touchdowns, um, and the offense was clicking. Uh, it just turned out that way. It was just, it was just one of those fairy tale things that happen uh, because playing Southern Cal is always a very, very tough football game. And in, and in this particular instance, we won the game 51 to nothing. And it was, it, it just got out of hand completely right away. If there was ever any doubt, this dominating display clinched Notre Dame's first national championship in 17 years. The rivalry reached its crescendo during the 11 years that Ara Persigian and John McKay stalked the opposite sidelines. Their final meeting was November 30th, 1974. It was a game neither man would ever forget. The Irish raced to a 24-0 lead. USC got one touchdown back just before the half, as Pat Hayden hit Anthony Davis on a seven-yard strike. That didn't bother me as, uh, as much. Uh, because we had we had done very well in the game but it the second half was one of those things that occurs in games you could visually see the momentum in the game and the attitudes change on the field and uh, all of a sudden the kickoff return on the opening kickoff of the second half that was the thing that turned and stunned gave them huge momentum and then you started looking for a brick mason because you knew there was trouble coming I mean the creek was rising fast and uh... It, it overflowed. It just once it got started, oh. What really happened uh, was that Southern California played the greatest 17 or 18 minutes of college football I've ever seen. Unfortunately, the Trojans' legendary eruption spoiled Ara Parsegian's Southern California swan song. I thought he was one of the best coaches that's ever been in football. And he quit after that game we played in the Coliseum. Parsegian's successor, Dan Devine, was looking for an edge when the teams faced off in 1977. Well, we, we were highly ranked going into that year. And our goal was to be number one. And we lost early in the season. So we, we, it was do or die. We could not lose a game. 
And uh, Southern Cal was ranked higher than we were. Uh, it was a game we had to have. So Devine used the color green to draw on the proud heritage of this football team. The first hint of Devine's theme came after Friday's practice, when tennis coach Tom Fallon addressed the team. They had him, I don't know if they had him or if he just chose, to sing an old Irish dirge. We're hanging men and women for the women of the green. And so, you know, it was our first indication of anything that had anything to do with green. So we get that, you know, we go to dinner. That night after dinner, we go over to the pep rally. Uh, Digger Phelps is at the pep rally. And then Digger starts making references to green. We will be the green machine. We are green machine. We are the green machine. I'll never forget that moment. And all of a sudden when they realized, oh my God, these are green, it's the Irish. The place went unbelievable, they just lost it. Jersey didn't win the game, blocking and tackling did because they were, they were a good football team. You had some guy named Joe Montana was playing quarterback, and, you know, stuff like that. Montana led an all-star cast with seven All-Americans to a dominating 49-19 victory. It was a game that propelled the Irish to six more wins and a national championship. I came there in 72, and I think from the 72 through 80, or somewhere 81, the winner of that game won the national championship or came in second nationally. So both teams were nationally ranked, um, and, and you know the winner was probably going to win the national championship or come very close to it. That tradition was renewed in 1988 when number one Notre Dame clashed with number two USC at the Coliseum. Tony Rice set a blistering pace for the Irish. Rice on the option, carrying for the first time to the 40, to the 45, down the sideline, at the 40, at the 30, at the 20. He could go all the way to 10 to 5. Touchdown, Irish! 65-yard run down the left side by Tony Rice. When it was over, the Irish had claimed a 27 to 10 triumph en route to an undefeated national championship season. 17 years later, top-ranked USC had aspirations of winning a second straight national title. On October 15th, the Trojans traveled to Notre Dame for a showdown they would never forget. I'm 25 years old, and the, the, the idea was one of those moments that you're gonna remember when you're 75, I'm gonna have my grandkid on, you know, on my knee, and I'm gonna be like, you know, I was there that day. I was there for the greatest college football game in history. Now granted, obviously, my scope of things is a little bit less than some others, but you just got the feeling and the electricity, like this was something big. This was something huge. We were down by three or four, and we get the ball, and we weren't smiling. We all had that grin on our face. Just kind of the New Jersey grin that I think we've all inherited over the past year some odd time. We knew it was time. We were scoring this touchdown. There was nothing that was going to stop us. Thomas in motion to the far side. Quinn looks, going to run it himself. Down to the five. End zone. Did he break the plane? Yes, touchdown. Brady Quinn took it himself and broke the plane on the goal line. The Irish led 31 28. But there were still two minutes to play, and the Trojans, winners of 23 straight games, were not about to go down without a fight. This is it. The second effort. And Southern California is going to win this game. You know, they, they made the play to, you know, the, the plays to, to win the game. There's, you know, I can't argue that. But it was tough. We had a game the next week, though. We had to get over it. You know, you, when you play football, you learn to have a short memory. But it definitely, when there's an emotional game like that and you lose, it takes a couple more days. But I think that was maybe the moment more than anything else that told some people, yeah, you know, Notre Dame could be for real again. What began humbly in 1926 has become the greatest intersectional rivalry in college football. The games were close, they were exciting, they were fun, they were something to point towards, they were something to look forward to. And when you get all those elements put together, you have yourself a major rivalry.
Notre Dame was a pretty good little powerhouse in its area, and a lot of the schools wouldn't play him, because they beat up on him. Dad sat down and wrote letters around the country, and this fellow, this cadet from Army, answered the letter, yeah, we've got an open day, we can schedule you. They had to haggle a little bit about the terms. Uh, Army said, we'll pay you $400, and Jesse said, we can't do it. Uh, so Army paid him $1,000, and uh, on uh, November 1st, 1913, uh, that game was played at West Point. Uh, Notre Dame brought 15 players, and uh, it was a very significant game. He had a great quarterback, Gus Ray, and a great end, Newt Rockney. Um, and they, the innovation was they threw long passes on the run, and, and no one had done that. If they had done it, they hadn't done it in front of a major audience. But they threw 30 and 40 yard passes, and no one ever saw that. Uh, the historians write that even the Army crowd stood up and cheered when they saw those plays. So for Notre Dame to, to beat Army and beat them so decisively and, and so spectacularly with the forward pass um, made, made Notre Dame uh, a real presence in the football world for the very first time. Harper's teams played three more games at West Point and lost just once. Canute Rockney continued to challenge the cadets when he took over and won six of the first nine games in the series. In 1928, Rockney summoned the ghost of the Gipper to energize his struggling team. It worked. The Irish won 12-6 as Butch Nemec threw a 32-yard touchdown pass to Johnny O'Brien with two and a half minutes left in the game. In 1935, the cadets carried a 6-0 lead deep into the fourth quarter, but the Irish started to drive. An interference call on this Bill Shakespeare to Wayne Milner pass put the ball on the one-yard line. Was there interference? What do you think? Larry Danborn took it in for a score with 29 seconds left to go. But Wally Fromhart missed the extra point, and the game ended in a 6-6 deadlock. Ended in a tie. Ten years later, Frank Leahy brought his second-ranked undefeated team into Yankee Stadium to play top-ranked Army. The anticipation for this one game was unprecedented. The war ended uh, in August of, of 45. 46, everybody knew, and Johnny Luchak would be back. Johnny Luchak would be back. The game had a one-year buildup. I remember I was, I was in ninth grade when it started and they played when I was a sophomore. Here was the first major college contest in the post-war era between clearly number one and number two. And indeed, you have four Heisman Trophy winners in this one game. And the buildup was phenomenal. Half the country had adopted Notre Dame as its favorite. The other half hated the Fighting Irish, so they had a built-in uh, people of interest. And then it was the, the Army team with Davis and Blanchard it captured uh, imaginations of people and, and coming together in New York City, uh, I think the combination of those things. Notre Dame had supposedly the best passer in the country. They had Johnny Lujak, Heisman Trophy winner the next year. They didn't throw any passes. Uh, we had uh, two of the uh, great runners and we didn't really use any real trick plays or anything. Everything was strictly three yards in a cloud of dust, and hoping for a break. Everybody was hoping for a break, and the break never came for either team. Uh, I don't, Notre Dame got down to the four yard line, and then Leahy uh, did not uh, kick a field goal. They never thought of field goals in those days. Yet he had a very good field goal kicker. A short field goal would have been a cinch for him. Both teams were playing not to lose, and uh, Lujak made that great game-saving tackle. Uh, and Lujak was an interesting guy. He was the quarterback from Notre, Notre Dame. He was also their hardest hitting defensive back. And those were the days when guys were going both ways. And Lujak made that uh, tremendous tackle, which probably saved the game for Notre Dame. Um, but the game was a big disappointment for a lot of people. The game of the century turns out 0-0. You know, who expected that? But the Notre Dame players got over their disappointment quickly. They went on to win three more games in the national championship. The following year, Army finally traveled to Notre Dame Stadium for the first time in the 34-game history of the series. 
The top-ranked Irish were in the midst of another national championship season and beat the ninth-ranked cadets 27 to 7. As big-time college football evolved, the two schools took divergent paths in the 1960s. The Irish continued their ascent to prominence, while Army struggled to find its niche in college football. But any and every time Notre Dame plays Army, the Irish expect to be tested. We were pre-warned by our coaches that these guys are really going to come after you because they haven't knocked off Notre Dame in such a long time. And the rivalry in the, the obvious uh, Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside uh, days uh, were very much a part of the tradition of this type of a rivalry, that we were always alerted to be prepared for anything. Notre Dame tried to join the Big Ten when it was formed in the 1890s, or tried again in the 1910s, um, and its final attempt in 1926 was totally rebuffed, although it thought it, it had a perfectly logical case. I don't know how hard we tried to get in. I'm not sure that we tried very hard, because our independence, I think, meant a great deal to us. I get the impression from what I read it was just a half-hearted attempt, perhaps knowing that we weren't going to be welcome. But we were willing to play Big Ten teams, and we certainly have played nearly all of them over the years. In fact, the University of Michigan was Notre Dame's very first opponent. They met in 1887. The Wolverines won that game and the next seven games they played. Finally, in 1909, Notre Dame ended Michigan's reign with an 11-3 triumph. It would be the last game the Irish and the Wolverines would play in 33 years. Notre Dame also began playing Michigan State, Indiana, Illinois, Purdue, and Northwestern in the 1800s. Iowa followed suit in 1921. Notre Dame traveled to Ohio State in 1935 for a game that would become one of the classics in Notre Dame history. We were a decided underdog, so it was going to be a big upset if we won it. Ohio State had been undefeated the year before, were ranked number one in the country, and were supposedly unbeatable. They had this coach, uh, Francis Schmidt, who had no mercy on them. Schmidt, I think they call him, and he was winning 60 to nothing against pretty good teams. We were totally outclassed the first half, and they were leading 13 to nothing. Then we gradually, well, we didn't come back to the fourth quarter, uh, went 13-6. Then we scored another touchdown, but we missed the extra point with just less than a minute to play, just seconds, really. So it was now 13-12, favor Ohio State. We had to kick off to them, and luckily they fumbled on the second play. We had a few seconds left and threw a touchdown pass. Here it is, it'll be first forward pass, and Shakespeare fading back again, there it goes. Oh, what a heave, still in spot, and he's high. And the game is over. What a game. <laughs> The series with Michigan resumed in 1942, and a year later, Notre Dame was challenged to a showdown in Ann Arbor. The Irish were ranked number one in the country. Michigan was second, but Notre Dame dominated. Creighton Miller romped 66 yards for the first score of the game. He finished with 159 yards rushing on 10 carries. Quarterback Angelo Bertelli threw two touchdown passes and scored a third himself. The 35-12 win thrust the Irish to yet another sensational season and the school's fourth national championship. In 1955, Iowa came to Notre Dame, determined to shut down Paul Horning and come away with a victory. It was a very important game for us. We were ranked very high in the country at the time. and. Uh, uh, it was a very emotional game. I had a pretty good fourth quarter. We I brought the team back with a couple passes and then a touchdown pass uh, to Jim Morris in the end zone and tied it up. It ended up, I kicked a field goal. Uh, and what was so unique about that, in, in the, which happens today a lot of times, it was in the last seconds of the ball game, your teammates rush on the field, and they carried me off the field. And Terry Brennan, who was our head coach, Nobody had ever been carried off the field in Notre Dame Stadium, ever. And that was a first. 
The most famous Big Ten game of all was staged on November 19, 1966, in East Lansing, Michigan. Top-ranked Notre Dame versus second-ranked Michigan State. I've never had uh, any game uh, during my whole coaching career that had the attention by the media that that game did. I spent the week in, in Lansing, Michigan. My colleague at the Chicago Daily News, Tom Fitzpatrick, spent the week at Notre Dame. And our job was to deliver daily reports to the newspaper describing the scene on campus. The only problem was that we didn't have 50,000 words per day. The train ride up from uh, in the East Lansing with the fans lined up all on the railroad tracks with signs, and then you get closer to East Lansing, and it would change from go Irish to kill Bubba Kill. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was huge. Probably the most vicious game that I've ever played in. The hitting was just intense. A lot of guys got hurt. A lot of guys went out of the game. Hand ready. He made he he rolled out to my side. And and I, I remember I was running full speed. And when he twists, when he came out of it, he was on one leg and standing like this with the ball. I said, oh baby. <laughs> You mind. And, and he left the game. The Spartans raced to a 10-0 lead before the Irish finally reached the end zone. Coley O'Brien, who had replaced the injured Terry Hanratty, hit an unlikely target for the touchdown. It was almost by accident, because primarily I was uh, used as a decoy. Number one, most of them didn't know who I was, uh, replacing Nick Eddy, of course, a great All-American who was injured and and uh, lo and behold I just with my blazing speed I just blew right by everybody I'm wide open I just stuck my hand up and, and Coley spotted me and threw it right in there and, and that's what we needed we needed to get on the board it was uh, real exciting real exciting at that period of the game but coach Ara Persegian's enthusiasm was tempered by the reality of O'Brien's health the problem with him was the week before that game, he came up with some curious uh, symptoms, and they checked him out. He, he had, I think, diabetes. And what would happen to him is if he had an attack, a diabetic attack, his eyesight would blur, which is not very good for a quarterback. That was, that was a factor in, in my thinking in the game. That, that's, that's, uh, uh, and so as a result of that, there were things that we didn't do while Coley was in there uh, that we might have done. So the Irish kept the ball on the ground and drove to the Spartan 10-yard line where they stalled. Joe Azaro came on and kicked a 28-yard field goal to knock the score at 10. Although Notre Dame dominated the second half, Coach Parsegian played it close to the vest. He had little choice. We lost the battery, we lost the starting center, we lost the starting quarterback, we lost the starting running back. And they had the ball, and they wound up punting to us with a very short amount of time left on the clock. And then they went into an absolute prevent defense where they, they dared us to pass. Duffy was uh, determined that Notre Dame was not going to throw the ball. Uh, he, they put Bubba Smith in the middle, and uh, he charged the passer all the time, and he was right on. And very fact, O'Brien was quite lucky to hand, get a couple of handoffs that he would, and he got a first down. We just missed a field goal. We tried a field goal. Uh, Joe Zero just pushed a little right. We couldn't have been more than six inches wide, uh, which would have been the game-winning points. But um, so when we got the ball back. We uh, we we ran it. We ran the ball, then we punted to them, uh, and they ran it out. I know that uh, Aero Persegan has taken a lot of. Uh, crap about that but he did a that was smart what he did he had another game to prove what they could do we didn't so why chance losing the game I was astounded frankly by the reaction that's what astounded me yeah we were all disappointed that we didn't win the football game but given the circumstances where you have your top running back on the bench with you, your top quarterback on the bench with you, your offensive center on the bench with you, your, your number two running back, Rocky Blyer on the bench. I can go on and on with all the things that are going on, yet somebody wants me to go ahead and be 
uh, score out against the team that we have been able to score one touchdown and throw on a, a bomb and somebody intercepts and runs back. I'd love to have seen the articles that were written if I make some dumb mistake, throwing the ball out in the flat, the kid intercepts it, they kick a field goal or score a touchdown, we get beaten the game. Aaron knew that he's going to come out of a tie with Michigan State and win the national championship because he's going to get the vote in New York, the vote in the East. But you had to be a dummy not to understand that, the way things were done back in those days. He just simply was a smart guy. In-state rival Purdue has also provided Notre Dame with some memorable games. In 1968, the Boilermakers were ranked number one, the Irish number two, going into their early season matchup at Notre Dame. Purdue played opportunistic football and turned three Notre Dame turnovers into points, while three more Irish miscues stalled promising drives. Purdue held on to its top ranking with a 37-22 win. Three years later, the Irish were again ranked second as they traveled to Purdue. The Boilermakers were unranked, but primed for the upset. There was an attitude on the team that uh, we were going to find a way to win. Purdue scored late in the second half on a, on a screen pass that was well executed and took the lead. And uh, now we were faced with uh, trying to get the ball back and, of course, trying to score. And in that situation, the defense really stepped up and, and held Purdue uh, deep in their own territory and forced them to punt. And uh, we just came in uh, with a defensive play where uh, the coaches had set up a, a punt block, and the punt block was successfully executed. And then instead of going for the seven point uh, tie, uh, Coach went for two, and, and uh, it was a great call and a great play, and we were able to pull that one out. I thought we were going to lose, <laughs> and at the end of the game, we won. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those things was fortunate enough. Well, I, we blocked their punt, and, uh, and we made the play at the end of the game that gave us a chance to at least stay undefeated. The Purdue game was also a very important turning point in the 1977 championship season. The Irish had lost the week before at Mississippi and could not afford another slip-up if they hoped to vie for the title. But freshman quarterback Mark Herman came out and threw a pair of touchdown passes to lead the Boilermakers to a 24-7 first-half lead. Coaches were just saying, Ross, you've got to get in there and get him. I mean, we told in the whole defense, Bob Golick, uh, Willie Fry, Luther Bradley, all of us, you know, we, we just knew we had to stop this freshman quarterback, who's phenomenal itself. But we, uh, long story short, he was ahead, and we had to put somebody in. Rusty Lish got hurt. I think Gary Forsythe at that time got hurt. And um, so Joe Montana's time. Joe came in. We all we said was, Joe, we need you, buddy. Come on, get it done. He said, no problem. I'll be out there. Went out there on the field, scored his first series. Game back, scored again. Okay, we're in the game. We're in the game. I said, the only thing we need to do is score one more time, get the ball back to Joe, and we can win. And that's what we did. We took the ball back, and Joe got in there and just uh, demonstrated his uh, athletic skill, his talent, and his leadership. A tremendous play. Montana calmly and methodically moved the team down to the Purdue 10 and then handed the ball to Dave Mitchell. And in motion out to the left-hand side, and he hands it off. It's dead to number 44, Dave Mitchell, and Mitchell up the middle, scores a touchdown! Mitchell scores right up the middle! And Notre Dame is on the scoreboard now in front, 30 to 24. As dramatic as the Purdue comeback was, it paled in comparison to the 1980 Michigan game. Trailing by a single point, the ball rested on the Wolverines' 34-yard line with four seconds to play. Oh my, Harry Oliver, left-footed soccer style kicker. The ball will be spotted down by Cagle at the 41, a 51-yard boot. This is the ball game, the kick is up, it is! Down, down, he made it! Oliver's kick may be the most dramatic moment, but there have been many outstanding individual performances during Notre Dame's illustrious series with Big Ten schools. 
Tim Brown provided one of those dazzling displays in the 1987 Michigan State game. Montgomery awaits the snap. Helmet high gets it. No rush on. Kick off the side of his foot. Returnable. Brown at the 30 yard line. Cuts to the right looking for a block. Tries to cut to the outside. Cuts inside. 35. He gets the 40. He gets the 45. 50. Down the sideline at the 40. He gets the 30. One man to beat 20. 15. 10. 5. Touchdown. Irish. TV Brown. 70 yards. Will Lightning strike twice? Brown to the 34, to the 35, cuts up field, gets to the 40, 45, he has the 50, down to the 40, 35, 30, one man to beat, down to the 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown again, Jimmy Brown! Tim Brown, by his senior year, reached that point where every time he touched the football, you knew that he was a threat to go the distance. When he would touch a football, you started to lean up a little bit in your chair because you knew that he had a chance to go the distance. Brown became the first player in college football history to return two consecutive punts for touchdowns. His electrifying runs sparked the Irish to a 31-8 win over the Spartans, and later that season earned Tim the Heisman Trophy. The next season, a walk-on kicker provided the heroics in the very first game. The Irish offense sputtered, so Reggie Ho came on to kick four field goals. The last came with just a minute 13 showing on the clock, and Michigan leading 17-16. Here it comes, the ball game on the line. Spot down, kick is up, and it is good! And the Irish take the lead! The Irish escaped with a 1917 triumph, a win that propelled them to an undefeated national championship season. The 1989 Michigan game figured another game-breaking individual performance. This time, it was Rocket Ismail, who deflated Ann Arbor's big house with two second-half kick returns. The Rockets' romps were more than enough to secure a 24-19 victory over the second-ranked Wolverines. It only got better the following season, when the two teams clashed at Notre Dame. The Irish were again ranked number one, Michigan was fourth. The Wolverines led 24-21 as quarterback Rick Meyer moved Notre Dame in for the kill. Well, it wasn't uh, the prettiest drive, maybe, but we did get down the field pretty efficiently. We, I want to say we got the ball with three or four minutes to go, and then uh, there's a few scrambles, a few running plays that kept drives a lot, the, the drive alive. But then the, the big play was the um, the touchdown that Adrian Gerald caught right on the goal line, and there's a big celebration. The Irish led 28 to 24, but Michigan quarterback Elvis Gerback still had more than a minute and a half to seek salvation. Reggie Brooks ended those hopes with the biggest interception of his career. The rivalry intensified in 2005, when new coach Charlie Weiss brought his Irish to Ann Arbor. The Wolverines were ranked third in the country, but the Notre Dame players were not intimidated. The more you hear, heard Charlie Weiss talk during his first year, the more you understood he had a plan, he was very confident. He was trying to instill that confidence in his players. And then you immediately saw the jump up in consistency in the way they played. Notre Dame held a 14-3 lead at the half. Michigan tallied a touchdown late in the game. But the Irish persevered and celebrated a 17-10 upset win. The following week, Notre Dame hosted Michigan State in its first home game of the Charlie Weiss era. Brady Quinn and Jeff Samarja teamed up for two first-half touchdown passes, but the Spartans went into the locker room at halftime nursing a 24-17 advantage. State added two more touchdowns in the third quarter to take a nearly insurmountable 38-17 lead. But the Irish would not go down without a fight. Trailing 38-31. The clock is now down to 2.36. Quick throw, near side, end zone, touchdown! Samarja! Samarja wide open from the slot on the right side. Notre Dame had staged the most remarkable comeback of the young football season to send the game into overtime before losing 44-41. Through the years, teams from the Big Ten Conference have provided the Irish with stiff competition and many memorable games. That's not to say that Notre Dame will ever become a member of the Big Ten or any other conference. 
the university has long cherished its distinction of independence. The more I spend time at Corby Hall and, and talk to the CSCs, the Holy Cross Fathers, you know, I, I get a real strong sense of the fact that we are and want to be the national parish. And the national parish just happens to operate a pretty elite institution called the University of Notre Dame. And for us to remain as this national preeminent entity, we need to be independent. We need to take our football coast to coast, north to south. What do we gain by joining the Big Ten? I mean, we, we're one of 10 or one of 11 or 12 different schools. As we are now, we're one of one school. For what independence is worth, I think it probably goes well with the Irish. The philosophy began in 1913. Coach Jess Harper decided to look beyond the immediate Midwest for competition. He succeeded in securing games with Army, Yale, Syracuse in the East, Nebraska, and South Dakota to the West. Harper even trudged to Texas for two games with the Longhorns. All these years later, Notre Dame is still unencumbered by a conference, playing a truly national schedule. I think Notre Dame football deserves the option and opportunity to be able to play anybody, anywhere, anytime, everywhere. And it just allows you to go after the best. And if you want to be the best, you have to play the best. And that's exactly what Notre Dame does. In 1952, the 10th ranked Irish welcomed 4th ranked Oklahoma into Notre Dame Stadium. It didn't take long to realize the talent and power of the Sooners. Star halfback Billy Vessels ran for 195 yards and three touchdowns. But the Irish fought back, led by the passing of Ralph Guglielmi and the multifaceted heroics of John Lattner. If we played Oklahoma in 1952 10 times, they would have beat us nine out of 10 times. But it was that particular day that we were able to beat them by a touchdown. Notre Dame also won the rematch the following year. But Oklahoma didn't lose another game. Until they met their nemesis in 1957, the Sooners owned a 47-game winning streak when they met the Irish on November 16th in Norman, Oklahoma. Just the year before, Oklahoma had taken apart Notre Dame 40-0, and they had done it in South Bend, which is unheard of. This year, the Irish have to go to Norman, and virtually nobody gave them a, a chance against Oklahoma. Notre Dame was still Notre Dame. You know, there was still some magic in that locker room. And they went out and they shocked Oklahoma 7-0. This was one of the biggest upsets in Notre Dame history. It didn't come at a particularly glorious time, which made it all the more dramatic. In 1961, the phrase, luck of the Irish, was a fitting explanation for their victory over Syracuse. Trailing 15-14 in the waning seconds of the game, Joe Prakowski attempted a 41-yard field goal that was no good. But an official called roughing the kicker and awarded Notre Dame another shot at victory. Prakowski made the most of his second chance, and the Irish were credited with a 17-15 win. In 1975, a tall, lanky kid from Pennsylvania became known as the Comeback Kid. Three times, Joe Montana led Notre Dame from the jaws of defeat to the outstretched arms of victory. Joe had that great facility of, of coming up with the right play at the right time. If you looked at Joe Montana and saw what a quiet demeanor he had, you would never suspect that he was inside this great competitor and uh, always had the facility of, 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 of pulling a team together. That's exactly what he did in Notre Dame's October 11th game against North Carolina. And we were struggling. Yeah, we were really struggling. And uh, we were down 14 to 6. And uh, they brought this young quarterback in off the bench. I think at the time he was a third stringer. It was by the name of Joe Montana. And uh, Joe led us to a touchdown and uh, tied the game at 14 all. We still had to get the ball back, which we did. And uh, with not much time left, uh, I was one of three wide receivers. At the time when I did my 10 yard route to the sideline, and the, the ball was actually thrown. I don't know if Joe would ever admit to it, but the ball was actually thrown a little bit behind me. I had to turn awkwardly. Caught the ball, but the cornerback tried to knock the ball down, and he fell and slipped. So I was pretty much left wide open to run down the sidelines for about 80 yard touchdown, and we won the game. But Montana didn't rest on his laurels. The very next week, he led the team back from a 20 point deficit against Air Force. Notre Dame won the game 31 to 30. 
13 years later, the roles were reversed when the fourth-ranked Fighting Irish hosted top-ranked Miami. In this game, it was Notre Dame who would have to survive a comeback by the Hurricanes. There was so much emotion in, in that stadium that day because, you know, this was uh, Notre Dame with all its tradition in Miami as, as the upstart, you know, the, the team that, that wanted to, to be where Notre Dame was. We knew that if we were going to win, it had to go through Miami. I mean, they'd won something like 36 football games in a row. But what was important about that game was our players believed they could win. Miami believed they couldn't lose. That was the epitome of what college football should be about. Sun splash day in South Bend. Miami weather, really. Miami weather in October. And Notre Dame just refused to buckle. Miami was a great football team, but they turned the ball over way, way too many times, as you know, in that game, and, and in critical situations in the red zone. But Notre Dame had something to do with that as well. Then Pat Terrell comes up with the, with the play in the end zone. Steve Walsh trying to get that go-ahead score. But Jimmy Johnson went for two, as he should have. And Notre Dame made the play, won 31 to 30, deserved to win, won the national title, and deserved it. I don't think Notre Dame realized quite how good they were until that game. And uh, they went on, they didn't lose again the rest of the year. It was Notre Dame's first 12-0 uh, season in history. It took Holtz three years to not only rebuild that program, but to put them back at the very top of college football. It, it was the day that Notre Dame woke up the echoes again. In 1992, quarterback Rick Meyer adapted the comeback kid persona of Joe Montana. The Irish trailed Penn State 19-6 on a cold and snowy November day in South Bend. Meyer had just over four minutes to score eight points. It wasn't our best game. We didn't do a lot on offense. Our defense played great. But our last drive, we put it together and extended the drive and got down to the four or five yard line. Get all the way to fourth down and have um, a little delayed pass to Jerome for, for a touchdown to come within one point. Now what, you know, we learned earlier with the Michigan tie that that doesn't feel very good to tie, especially if you have the momentum. So uh, coach let us go for two, which was huge. And uh, um, that particular play, you know, Reggie Brooks catches his second pass of the season to score this two point conversion to win the game with 20 seconds to go. But he was about the fourth option. I mean, we, I scanned all the way across the field and scrambled around a little bit. and made it hard on him, but he lays out and catches the ball in the corner of the end zone and the place goes crazy. It was a moment beyond a description of mere words. A moment that will be remembered as one of the most heroic rallies in the history of college football. The following year marked another clash for the ages. Undefeated and second ranked Notre Dame, hosting unbeaten top ranked Florida State. It was November 13th, 1993. There was a lot of hype and a lot of anticipation. And I remember uh, being a senior going into that game that I knew that that game was going to define uh, a lot of our careers as seniors about how we would be remembered at the University of Notre Dame. Nobody gave Notre Dame a chance to beat Florida State. This was a tremendous Florida State team. You know, on Friday, Florida State shows up and they, they emerge onto the stadium field at Notre Dame Stadium, and they're wearing green baseball hats with the FSU logo on them. And Holtz just latched onto that like a you know, dog on a bone, and, and he whipped his team into an emotional state. Although the Seminoles struck first, the Irish came roaring back and streaked to a 21-7 halftime lead. Burris right side down to the five, touchdown! On the hole at right tackle, Jeff Burris for a score. Notre Dame kicked a field goal to open the third quarter, but then Charlie Ward jump-started the Seminoles. Back to throw, looks, swings it out, it goes to Dunn, Dunn for the touchdown. Notre Dame countered with Jeff Burris. 
Here's Fela. Hands it off to Burris. Burris under the 10. Five. Touchdown. Jeff Burris. Now the outcome of the game rested squarely on the shoulders of the Notre Dame defense. We knew that our defense was not going to come this far and let us down in the end. And that's exactly what happened. And on that last play, Charlie Ward is great a quarterback as he is and as much talent as they had. The defense found a way to dig deep and find a play and get the win. Three seconds left to play. 31-24. Notre Dame. Last play of the game. This is it. Ward flushed out of the pocket. Going in the end zone. Knocked down by Wooden. The game is over. The Irish is upset. Florida State. Notre Dame wins. Pandemonium on the field. 31-24. Notre Dame is number one. If there was ever any question about the, the power and mystique of that stadium and that campus and the history and tradition of that program, it was all reinforced that week. Since 1913, the University of Notre Dame has traversed the land, seeking the very best competition in college football. It began quite simply as a way to expand their horizons and upgrade their standing in college football. Now, Notre Dame is the most coveted opponent in the land. When you're a college football player, you know one day it's going to end. You know, maybe you'll play pro or maybe you won't, but college football is this very special time in the lives of athletes. And one day you'd like to sit down with your buddy you know, over a beer and say, hey, you know what? We beat Notre Dame. We beat the best. In 1924, Notre Dame won all nine games it played and was invited to participate in the Rose Bowl. Knut Rockne and his team accepted and traveled by train to California. There, they would meet the Stanford Indians, coached by Pop Warner. Rockne brought 33 players, including the four horsemen. Stanford would counter with its own workhorse, Ernie Nevers. Ernie Devers was unbelievable. I mean, Stanford, from what I recall and read, outplayed him, but Notre Dame found a way to win. Stanford amassed 316 yards of offense, but committed eight costly turnovers. The Irish took advantage and won the game 27 to 10 to claim their first national championship. It was Notre Dame's first and only bowl appearance in more than four decades. It was a great thing for college football because of Notre Dame being there. And then, of course, the very fact that they gave up going to bowl games for 45 years after that was unusual in itself because everybody thought Notre Dame was in there for the money and all this stuff for football. And, but they sucked at their guns. They didn't believe in postseason post play. It took away from classes, and that's the way they believed it. But all that changed in 1969. We used to have the first semester end near the end of January, and... Um, the kids would have to come back facing exams. Now we had gone into ending the first semester before Christmas, so they'd finished the exams. So this meant that the football players would not have academics hanging over their head. The administration was also seeking new revenue sources to fund minority scholarships. And then there was the matter of football itself. We didn't belong to the conference, okay? We didn't play in bowl games. So the only thing that we had to shoot at was for a national championship and an undefeated season. Any early season loss, we couldn't make up in a bowl game. Father Hesburgh and Father Joyce, uh, besides being great men of great character who believe very strongly that Notre Dame uh, should epitomize the best of college sport and certainly the best of college football, were also very practical men. Uh, and Notre Dame was, in effect, uh, being, being shut out of championship potential and of course a lot of money involved so for the first time since 1925 the Irish accepted an invitation to play in a bowl game they would meet top-ranked Texas in the Cotton Bowl we were convinced that by our coaches that we could in fact invent a defense that could slow them down enough and if we could muster enough offense we could in fact put that number one ranking in jeopardy and we were able to sustain that until the very, very closing uh, seconds of, uh, of that ball game, and we wound up losing just at the end. But it was a great ball game. 
we were highly flattered and highly honored that Notre Dame broke their no bowl uh, appearance record, they, uh, their, their uh, rule rather, and they decided to accept the Cotton Bowl because we were ranked number one. Era wanted to play the number one team and were that close to, to knocking us off and then the next year they did. They, they ended our 30 game win streak. The rematch was played on January 1st, 1971, back at the Cotton Bowl. Even though the Irish lost the previous year, Harrah Persegian found a way to win this time. We realized that we couldn't go in with the standard defenses, and we went in with what we call the mirror defense uh, to try to mirror them. They'd go one direction, we would go with them. Uh, it was almost like a man-to-man -man, uh, situation. We didn't stop their running game, but we broke the continuity of it. Uh, we created fumbles because we had people coming in. And what we forced Texas to do uh, was to throw the ball. You know, you're thinking, we got, got them where we want them now. Uh, well, we didn't because they completed some key passes that uh, influenced the out, didn't influence the outcome of the game, but they came closer than we thought it would be under the circumstances. Having the opportunity to, to win the Cotton Bowl, having the opportunity to beat Texas, and, and really, I think, we should have been the national champion. If you beat number one, you should be there. Three years later, the Irish would get that opportunity again. It was a perfect matchup. Alabama was number one, Notre Dame was number three. It was the North against the South. It was the Catholics against the Baptists. It was Arab Harsigian against Bear Bryant. It was these two great programs with these incredibly rich traditions and they had never played against each other. We played pretty well offensively. We moved the ball, we were able to get down the field, score a touchdown, and um, in, in the first quarter, basically, it was all Notre Dame. Uh, we moved the ball offensively. Our defense um, shut them down pretty good. Then in the second quarter, it kind of turned around. They, they adjusted to what we were doing and stopped us a little bit, and then their offense got going. They scored a touchdown, but then we came right back with a, a kickoff return for a touchdown, which was a big play. Coming down at about the seven yard line, it's taken there by Hunter to the 15, to the 20, to the 25, to the 30, to the 35, the 40, the 45, the 50, the 45, the 40, the 35, the 30, the 25, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5. Touchdown, Notre Dame. And there's a momentum shift, the same thing that happened in the Southern Cal game happened in that game. All of a sudden, now, bingo, you're back on the board, and they're back on the field trying to march it down three and four yards. You just did this. You've got to do it again. You know, there, there's a the psychology that goes with a big play like that. No question that was a huge play. But the Crimson Tide rallied in the third quarter to take a 23-21 lead. The Irish remained calm and strung together a drive of their own, culminating in a Bob Thomas 19-yard field goal. But Alabama still had almost four and a half minutes left to win the game. The Notre Dame defense stiffened, and Bama was forced to punt. The boot was perfect and pinned the Irish back on the doorstep of their own end zone. We were trying to get a first down, um, didn't want to make a mistake. We were backed up in our own end zone where any bad thing that happened could have resulted in a, in a safety. Um, but, uh, you know, Error made the call and uh, I'm sure surprised a lot of people. We certainly surprised the Alabama defense. And this was, the, this was a long bomb coming whistling out over my shoulder. And he slightly overthrew me, but I was able to snag it, uh, you know, my, with my fingertips, literally. Weber juggles the ball. The ball's bouncing up and down <laughs> when I'm watching this. My heart came out. I said, my God, he almost dropped the ball. And the whole stadium just sort of, pro-Alabama being in the Sugar Bowl, the whole stadium just sort of went limp, and Notre Dame ran out the clock. Great, great finish to a terrific game. To me, that was one of the finest football games ever played. From the standpoint of the talent on the field on both sides, certainly the great head coaches in Bear and Era, uh, Everything that you could have put into a football game was there. Best football game I've ever seen. Absolutely. The rematch was played the following year at the Orange Bowl in Miami. It was Ara Persigian's final game as coach of the Irish. You know, I, 
I've known Eris since I was 16 years old, 50-some uh, years now. I played for him, I coached with him. We've been friends forever. And the one thing he would never do is blow his own horn or take all the credit. And he certainly wasn't going to ask that group of guys, hey, guys, win this one for me. He just wasn't going to do that. The seniors were killing each other that we could practice. I mean, these guys were so emotional. They loved Parsegi, and they wanted to go out with a victory for ERA. And honestly, Alabama was secondary to winning it for ERA. The Irish would not be denied in their quest and scored the first 13 points of the game. In motion to the right side, that's Samuel. The tide kicked a field goal before halftime, but the Notre Dame defense was determined to keep Alabama out of the end zone. After a scoreless third quarter, Bama was forced to the air and scored on a 48-yard pass. A successful two-point conversion sliced the Irish lead to just two points but that was as close as it would get. The 13 to 11 triumph was a fitting conclusion to the era of Ara. And he went out in, a, in beautiful fashion with another huge upset uh, over a tremendous Alabama team. And uh, Bear Bryant had great, great respect for Parsegian and Parsegian for Bryant. These were two of the giants in college football. Dan Devine led Notre Dame back to the Cotton Bowl to conclude the 1977 season. The Irish had lost the second game of the year, but were ranked fifth with a 10-1 record. Their opponent, Texas, was undefeated and ranked number one. Everybody we met on the streets in uh, Dallas, Texas, like, you're playing Texas? Ah, forget it. You guys aren't going to win. They're 10-0. You're 9-1, so you don't have a chance. They said, well, they haven't played us yet. You know, they haven't met the talent that we have on our team. Browner came up with the first big play of the game, recovering an Earl Campbell fumble. The Irish converted Browner's good fortune into a field goal. The Longhorns responded with a kick of their own before the first quarter ended. When the teams returned to the field, Terry Urich led an Irish resurgence. Had an opportunity to uh, contribute to the team effort, scored two touchdowns, made a couple tackles on special teams. Uh, and that's kind of the way to conclude a, a storybook ending to any football career, any career whatsoever. And then to be voted national champs uh, that next day was just outstanding. It was the uh, icing on the cake, it really was for us. The Irish returned to the Cotton Bowl the very next year to play Houston. But the scene was markedly different. And at the time, it wasn't necessarily uh, a, a huge bowl game in terms of national impact. I think both teams were in the top 10, but there was not a national championship riding on it or anything. I think both teams had three losses coming to the game. And this was the game in Dallas uh, where the weather was horrendous. They'd had a huge ice storm the previous day. I remember riding on, on the way to the uh, stadium. And I was sitting in the back of the bus with Montana and a few other guys, and we were saying, there's no way this game's going to happen today. There was nothing moving except our bus. But play they did, and what a game it was. It was Joe Montana's finest hour. But soon after the touchdown, Montana began to struggle. He was suffering from hypothermia. With Joe on the bench, the Cougars made a run and took command of the game. But after thawing out at halftime, Montana returned to rally the troops. Montana calls the signal. He's dropping back. He looks through the end zone. He throws it. It is incomplete. It's a touchdown. It's a touchdown. It, it looked as though it was going to be incomplete, but somehow Chris Haynes caught the ball. Time has expired. The score tied 34 to 34 in the, the Cotton Bowl. The signal, the snap, the spot, the kick. It is on the way. It is good. And Notre Dame wins 35 to 34. Ten years later, another national championship was on the line when top-ranked Notre Dame tangled with third-ranked West Virginia in the Fiesta Bowl. 
Lou Holtz had guided his team to 11 consecutive wins, and nothing or no one could stop them now. We walked into the Fiesta Bowl the day before the, the game. The only thing we did was assign various players to carry the seniors off the field. So you four are going to carry this individual off, and you three are going to carry this off, etc. And just trying to build a confidence. Once the game started, it was a great air of electricity. Uh, we jumped on top of them. We kept Major Harris contained, and we really had the game under control. It was just an incredible year, but it probably wasn't our best football team. Our best football team in Notre Dame was probably in 89. But the Irish stumbled once in 1989, losing the final game of the regular season to Miami. So Notre Dame was ranked fourth when it challenged number one Colorado in the Orange Bowl. The Irish stated their case loud and clear, beating the Buffaloes 21-6 but it wasn't enough to make up for the loss to Miami. And the Hurricanes were crowned national champions. Year in and year out, participation in bowl games has become an important tradition for the Irish. Notre Dame was forced to change with the times and never looked back. There will be more victories, Heismans and national championships to come for the Irish. There will also be gut-wrenching defeats, coaching changes, uncertainty. But through it all, the University of Notre Dame will endure, undeterred in its mission, fueled by the hope of tomorrow. The University of Notre Dame has boasted some of the greatest players in college football history. No school has more consensus All-Americans than Notre Dame. Forty-five players have been honored as academic All-Americans, while over 90% of all Notre Dame football players have graduated. Notre Dame players have also won their share of awards, including Lombardi, Outland, Maxwell, and seven Heisman trophies going into the 2006 season. The Heisman Trophy uh, was not a big, a big trophy in the beginning. I mean, it wasn't even called the Heisman Trophy until the second year, which was 1936. And it really, it, it, it became big in the 60s. But before the award became prestigious, Notre Dame players captured four of the bronze trophies. The first was Angelo Botelli, who was honored in 1943 the year Coach Frank Leahy won his first national championship. Leahy made an adjustment the previous year that paved the way for both the title and the Heisman. He switched to the T formation, a move that transformed Bertelli into a star. Bertelli completed 69% of his passes and threw 10 touchdown strikes in six games before being called into military service. His successor at quarterback, John Lujak, picked up where Bertelli left off. The war also interrupted Lujak's football career, but he returned in 1946 and strung together two more sensational seasons. In fact, 
though Jack won three national championships at Notre Dame, while passing for over 2,000 yards and 81 touchdowns. So in 1947, Lou Jack was honored with Notre Dame's second Heisman Trophy. Lou Jack had a pretty good right end on that 1947 team named Leon Hart. But Hart had absolutely no knowledge of the Heisman. So when Hart got a telegram in 1949 informing him that he had won the award, Leon sought out one of his coaches for an explanation. And I said, Coach, uh, what's the Heisman Trophy? And he said, oh, you got that. He said, oh, he said that's some big deal in, in New York City. Uh, John Lujak won it uh, in 1947. He said, you ought to go. Now when I think about it, it is not a, uh, the Heisman Trophy is a badge that you wear for the rest of your life. Hart is one of only two linemen to win the trophy in its entire history. He also helped coach Frank Leahy compile a four-year record of 36 wins, two ties, no losses, and three national titles. Hart gave way to John Lapner, who in 1953 captured one of the closest races in Heisman history by just 56 votes. He was a jack of all trades who could run, pass, catch, block, and return both kicks and punts. It was probably his four touchdown performance against USC in Los Angeles that put him over the top. In those days, television wasn't a big impact, but out there, if you played good on the coast, you get the sports writers from the coast on your side. And fortunately, I apparently got a lot of the South, uh, Southern California uh, journalists and sports writers on my side because they're the ones that vote on him. And I had a big day here in Philadelphia when we played the University of Pennsylvania, so I, I was a very fortunate young man. Latner, Hart, and Bartelli all played on dominating Notre Dame teams. But Paul Harning did not. When he won the Heisman Trophy in 1956, the Irish had won just two games. Still, Horning beat Tennessee's Johnny Majors by 72 votes. Horning punted and passed and ran the ball. It was not as many yards as, as Majors, but he also led the team in, in interceptions, in punt returns, and kickoff returns. You see things that, that they didn't do. He did everything. Horning was in class when word of his selection reached sports information director Charlie Callahan, who promptly summoned Paul to his office. So they walk into Charlie Callahan's office, and Charlie Callahan's on the phone talking to Paul Horning's mother. Puts the phone down, puts his hand over the speaker and says, Paul, it's your mother. Tell her you just won the Heisman Trophy. Coming back from the Heisman Trophy, I brought my mom back, and they just treated us around New York. It was one of the great trips that I can remember in my lifetime. Coming in here at the DAC and, and giving this award. This has always been, uh, to me, the, uh, the mo one of the most important moments in my life because this award just follows you forever. It really does. Uh, it's the only uh, lasting uh, award in college or pro football. I mean, if I ask somebody, uh, how many times, how many times do you think I'm the most valuable player in the National Football League? Nobody know. You know, they wouldn't know, but they know I've won the Heisman Trophy. When Ara Persigian took over as coach in 1964, he gave John Hewitt new life. There was no quarterback going into the season. And he, John Hewitt, who had started a couple of games in 63 uh, with no particular success, uh, he, he liked his quick release and footwork and uh, he gave him the quarterback right away. Hewitt threw for over 2,000 yards and 16 touchdowns that year while leading the Irish to one of the most remarkable turnarounds in college football history. 23 years later, the Notre Dame Heisman fraternity welcomed a new member. Tim Brown won the award in 1987 after amassing over 5,000 all-purpose yards. Once he gained the confidence as a player, uh, his natural ability started to take over. And then to watch a young man's development you know, from a teenager into a young man. So you saw the personality come out and then clearly the personality and athletic skills came out on the football field. Football awards have always been plentiful at Notre Dame, but that recognition has always taken second place to the accomplishments achieved in more important endeavors. 
All of these award winners became successful leaders and pillars of their communities. They became exemplary role models whose dedication and perseverance defines their success. That is their legacy at the University of Notre Dame. Looking at the game faces of these players poised in the tunnel at Notre Dame Stadium, only the uniforms tell you what they play are instruments, not football. We have this history with the university. It was started the very, at the very beginning with Father Soren's programs early on. Then football came on and the two grew hand in hand. Long before there was football at Notre Dame, there was the band. It goes back at least to 1846 and holds claim to being the oldest collegiate band in continuous existence. Its connection to football is undeniable. The band is part of that mystique. It brings a certain spirit. It touches people's uh, emotions, people's memories. They associate the victory march and the band playing with all the great times of the past, present, and future. 380 members strong, the band's style is different from most, especially in its high-stepping marching. They practice about as much as the football team does. Usually very intense. Uh, Dr. Dye, our director, he's always shouting at us and whatnot, but uh, it's, it's really a good chance to, you know, get to know everyone else in band. And typical of Notre Dame, the traditions are powerful. As with the team, game day starts with prayer then a concert on the steps of Bond Hall. After the concert, they march through campus to the stadium. It's so amazing because first they line the whole way to the stadium for the football players when they leave uh, mass. And, they, and we watch that as we're you know, coming over. To do, then we go and we do our inspection after they do that, and then all the people who lined one side of the quad go to the other side to line that side and watch the band march in. And, and they're lining the whole way there. I mean, that's a good, you know, it's a good, well, probably a 10 minute march, and people are lining the whole way there, so it's an amazing feeling. In front of the band, for more than 50 years, the 10 members of the Irish Guard, each at least six feet two. They help protect the band. On game days, they march in the front. They're very tall and large and intimidating, so they, immediately people want to get out of their way <laughs> when they when they come up there. Some people don't though. Some people want to be moved personally because uh, they want to be touched or pushed out of the way by the Irish Guard. But for the most part, uh, they're, that's one of their big jobs is sort of a protection aspect. Not so much to protect but intimidate. They also serve to uh, uh, intimidate other football teams at, at times. At least they try to do that. <laughs> That was the strength, that was the courage, that was the leadership, the silent leadership that I think exemplifies Notre Dame. And uh, to this day, I really respect those guys and, and what it is they did for us. In the residence halls where all students room together, band members and football players sometimes find themselves roommates. On the campus, classmates. In the stadium, on game day, in a very real sense, teammates. Uh, as a player, you were aware of the band. They were kind of like your anonymous ally. You would see the guys around campus, you would say hello, but you didn't really know who they were. You had a couple guys maybe lived in your dorm that were in the band, but we certainly respected them. And when it came time to play and they were playing the songs that they played, we got fired up. When people that come from out of town, you know, to a game in South Bend, hear those songs, I mean, it puts it all together for them. I think it makes it real. And, you know, that's the atmosphere that it's a little different than some of the other places you can go because it's, those are our songs and, and we're not sharing them with anybody. It's not something that you hear other places. They, they belong to Notre Dame. While the game is on, the band members balance between playing those songs and being fans, especially after an Irish score. I ju I'm jumping up and down. There isn't anything. I have the same reaction as any fan in there, but then I take my pulse right afterwards and I make sure the band's doing the right thing and they're not, you know, they're make sure they're playing a victory march and fast enough so that we're going to stay ahead in the game. When the teams leave the field at halftime, it is the marching band's time to shine. 
I used to watch the Notre Dame football games on TV when I was in high school and think, wow, that'd be really neat to be there, that'd be cool. And then all of a sudden when I was a senior and I was in the band and forming the ND on the field, I kind of thought to myself, you know, with a little bit of a tear in my eye, I thought, wow, I can't believe I'm right in the middle of this. And the first time I um, was actually on the field, in pre-game making the indie, I was just like really like, wow, I can't believe I'm right here. Like, I'm actually on the field doing this, so it's really exciting. It is another example of what Notre Dame stands for and why the Notre Dame band is such an integral part of football and the university. They were family. Uh, I think not just, you know, the band, but the whole university feel like when we go into that stadium, it's 80,000 people united for a common cause. Her loyal sons and daughters marching onward to victory. We actually came up with the title before we did anything else though. And I wanted something that would be recognizable and, and to the point. And there's nobody that doesn't know what Here Come the Irish means, at least around here. John Scully had written a lot of music, much of it for national commercials, with Grammy Award winner Jim Tulio, who's worked with such artists as Aretha Franklin and Richie Havens, when in 1997, they decided to embark on a project many would see as impossible. And we had just finished a project for the NBA, uh, and Jim asked me what I wanted to do next, and I said, Hands down, I want to do music for Notre Dame. And he was, he was a little bit taken aback because there's kind of a, a famous piece of music over here. It would take a lot of nerve to try to write a new anthem for Notre Dame. A replacement, unthinkable. But rather than write a song that was either football or even sports oriented, we wanted to, uh, to articulate a common thread of experience on campus, and it includes all the above, uh, including uh, academics, intramural sports, uh, and all the intangibles. We, we look for a true Celtic uh, theme uh, to the music, um, which Jim has worked with a lot of Irish artists over the years, and, and uh, that's our affinity is for Irish American music, so that wasn't too difficult uh, to do. I wrote the lyrics to the, the chorus first, and there's a magic in the sound of their name here from the Irish of Notre Dame. And uh, it fit perfectly with what we had written already musically. Uh, and from that point, the, the, the uh, verses just fell in my lap. It was a, probably the easiest piece of music uh, I've ever had to write. The music and lyrics are powerful and haunting, and the soulful voice of Kathy Richardson brings the song to life. What we were looking for was a, a Joan of Arc vibe to the music, um, the rallying the troops uh, around the hillside. And um, we had done a lot of work with Kathy and um, knew she'd be the right person to do it. She actually came into the studio and read the lyrics as she kind of hummed along through the first go through. And she said, well, I have it. She sang that whole thing on the first take with no edits to my recollection. There is not a word about football in the lyrics, but the mystique of Notre Dame and Notre Dame football are inextricably woven together. John Scully was a six foot five, 255 pound All-American center at Notre Dame, a tri-captain who graduated in 1981 and played nine years with the NFL Atlanta Falcons. Music was always his first love. I'd have to say I'm probably better known at Notre Dame as a composer than I am as a football player, uh, which is it's fine by me. But it's, it's, re it's received, yes, uh, universal, uh, universally a good reception of people that have been married to the track and people who have actually been buried to it as well uh, that I've been made aware of. So um, it's probably emotionally, uh, outside of my family, uh, one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. Today, with by means of the shift, open formation, and uh, 
Reverses, double reverses in plays of that type. A coach is able to utilize a small, smart, smart, active, agile chap who outsmarts the other big man by getting the blocking angle on him, by outwitting him, by outmaneuvering him. And he has a much better display than the big dull clodhopper uh, who weighs 250 pounds. The thing I want to stress, man, is the fact that when you come out here early, before the regular organized practice begins, go out and practice those things in which you're weak. And if you're weak on blocking, get a hold of some men and go out there and practice, perform, how to block them correctly. It isn't necessary to see a good tackle, you can hear it. Tackling requires leg drive, courage, and fine judgment of timing and distance. That's all. A lot of technical knowledge might be exposed here, but that's all that's necessary for any boy to tackle. Well, I was very favorably impressed with that scrimmage I saw Saturday, men. In many ways. I think uh, Hunk Anderson here and Shevney have been working hard with you all spring and it shows results. You weren't good, but not bad. There isn't a thing we can't polish off in three or four weeks in the fall. But I want you to stay out one more week here and it's, it's gonna be hot. But uh, there's certain things I want you to do. I want the centers to practice on their passing. The guards in a double coordination. Tackles on developing a little more aggressiveness and the ends on their shift, and the whole backfield on their forward pass defense. And uh, let's work hard on it for a week and show that same spirit you showed when I was gone in the spring. And we'll come back here September 15th, it's all set to kick off and put over the same kind of season we had last year. What do you say? I don't care two cents whether you're black or white. If you Catholic or Protestant, the best men are going to make this club. And I want you to go out there and give everything you have. From what I see here this afternoon, I think we're going to have a pretty good team. The trouble is, uh, I don't know how good the other fellows are going to be, and maybe our schedule is a little too hard. All right, now, Tobin, you and Larry here, I know the end. Mahoney, get that tackle alone. McMahon, you use the camel block and the guard. And next to you pull on. And use the rolling block in the center. You plug the gap there, uh, Tom. And Cochran, you trail the center from behind here. You charge long line of scrimmage here, Leahy, so he can't come through and then go through for the secondary. You go right through for the secondary right away. Square, angle play. All right, hit the defensive fullback. Got that all clear, man? All set? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's go here. All right. All right. Signal. 85, 96, 22. Hip. One, two, three. Hip. Hey, hey. <laughs> I guess I thought I didn't know who you were. Huh? All Indiana halfback. When that Kemmick is by, he won't dare run by. Let's just show him your clippings. Let's try that again, see if you can't do something. All right, come on, let's go here. All right, let's go. Come on, baby. Watch this, throw some lights now. Put that stuff on real. Let's go here. Signal. 82, 41. Hip. One, two, three. Hip. All right, come on, baby. Get up, come on. Oh, that's the way. That's the way to get him. Now, that's something like it. All right, now we're getting warmed up. Now, the success of any team, men, based on team play, same as we've shown all year, sacrifice, unselfish sacrifice. These other fellas, they say, are pretty good, but I think we're better. And I think if we get ourselves keyed up to a point, we're confident in that. Why, the results will take care of themselves. All right, now in the kickoff, if we receive, the little man drop back on the receiver and block long. I don't know the name style. And if we kick off, where well, the rest of these teams walk, let's run down fast. This is fast as you can run. And then we go on defense. And on defense, I want the center in and out of that line according to the situation. You as your old head, and I want you guards charging through as far as you can go on every play. They expect to play right over you every time. And the tacklers, they want you to go in a yard and a half and then check yourself. Spread your feet, squat down and all, and be ready with your hands and elbows so you won't be sideswiped. But I want the ends in there fast every play. Every play, but under control. And you men in the backfield, I want you to analyze before you move. 
And they throw a forward pass. They throw a pass, wait till you see the ball in the air. And then go and get it. And when they get it, boys, that's when they go on offense. That's when we go to them. And don't forget, we're going to pick it on one, one tackle they've got this week. We're going inside them. We're going outside them. Inside them and outside them. And when we get them on the run once, we're going to keep them on the run. And we're not going to pass unless our secondary comes up too close. But don't forget, man, we're going to get them on the run. We're going to go, 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 go. And we aren't going to stop until we go over that goal line. Don't forget, man, today is the day we're going to win. They can't lick us and the flesh out of the goal. The first whistle of man win there. Fight, 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 fight. But we're having a big business depression. And I want to say, from my analysis, that is caused to a large extent by the wrong psychology of a lot of businessmen. They alibi, they justify defeat, or they feel sorry for themselves. Now, I don't know where they've gotten that spirit, but cert that certainly is not the spirit of football. The thing that could help them most, the thing that could inspire them and refresh them, would be to go out and see a high school or a college team play basketball and play football, because there, they do not justify defeat. Those lads do not feel sorry for themselves. But they stick in there and give the best out of themselves until the last whistle blows. A DC-9 Southern Airways plane carrying Marshall University's football team, rooters and crew, crashed and burned in moderate rain and fog in West Virginia. All 75 persons aboard were killed. It was the worst plane crash in the United States this year. The story of We Are Marshall is a timeless story. This is a snapshot of what happens when immeasurable grief comes into the collective lives of this community in Huntington, West Virginia, and what they do to dig deep and sort of find their inner hero and move on. It takes place in the, the healing process. You know, what happens after that loss. It's a movie much more about the human drama around this. I mean, football really is the backdrop for it. It has such incredible relevance and resonance. Uh, it's a surprise to me that hasn't been told until now. We are Marshall! We are Marshall! After this plane crash, there are many people in the town and in the school said, let's take a breath. Let's cancel the season, maybe suspend the program. Let's just figure it out. You're sympathetic to that notion of, let's just wait a minute and, and heal a little bit and think about what the right thing to do is. The importance of a football program in a university that's in a town of 40, 50,000 people. Everybody goes to the football game. Whoa, this is something really, really potent. Council realizes that they can't get rid of the program. These students and these kids are going to fight to keep it alive. It took this guy from the outside that wasn't dealing with what everybody was dealing with in this community to sort of inject a really intense optimism to moving forward at all costs. They gave me a chance to be a college coach and help a school that really had some major problems, and I felt I could rebuild that program. You came in with a different plan. If you lose your entire team the year before, there's not a how-to or go-to book for what coaches to get. This is my varsity team, huh? Yeah, it was four of us, but one of us ain't here, so it's just two. Well, I'm usually bad with names. So the good news is I may actually be able to keep you fellas straight. I've looked at it this way. He wasn't only the final straw, he was the only straw. Two quarters. One game. It's right there. And it's just lovely when you immerse yourself in a picture and you look at McConaughey as Jack Langlois. You look at Matthew Fox as Red Dawson, and you just can't imagine anyone else playing those roles. I think it's the first time I've ever played a character who is living and breathing and you know a man that I was going to get an opportunity to actually speak to and uh, pick his mind about his recollections and memories and images from that time in his life. Red Dawson decided to stay and go on a scouting mission looking for another, other players for the next year instead of get on the plane. That choice kept him alive. He's a really special guy and you know his experience 35 years he's been really carrying the weight of the circumstances of that night and the fact that he wasn't on that plane and you know I think it's been a very very difficult thing for him to uh, to deal with. It's kind of eerie. Uh, he's got me down uh, pretty much Pat. 
I look at Matthew Fox and I feel that he intimately understands the power of stillness. And I think that was something that was specific to the Red Dawson character. 19's got six catches for 95 yards, Nate. And all of them because he knows that you can't go to your right. And in this picture, football is a metaphor for a life well lived. Through the game of football, getting on the proverbial playing field, this community in their own lives got back in the game of life. This is about putting one foot in front of the other. The most important thing being that we play the game. From the ashes rose the phoenix, and I think it probably portrays what I think is one of the greatest lessons in college sports, and that's to face adversity, get back up off the ground, and go on to continued success. That's the idea of We Are Marshall. When you feel like quitting, when you feel like not moving on, if you really love and you really respect those who have fallen, move on nonetheless, and one day it'll all make sense again. Oh, my God.